And welcome back. We're doing two videos today. I know I'm wearing exactly the same thing. I'm in the same position. So I'm not going to lie to you. Uh, I am so, so pleased to have Emma join us because Emma is the reason why this series is called Catastrophic Candor. It's a conversation I had with her, oh, I don't know, four to six months ago. Uh, Emma, hello and welcome. Hello. Uh, tell, us, uh, tell us about what you do. Well, when I'm not being catastrophically candid with you, um, I'm, what do I do? So I uh, play, but not as much as I'd like to, I think. We've got a little uh, social enterprise called Playful Anywhere, which has shipping containers of playful things. They're a bit like TARDISes, and they're not doing a great deal at the moment due to lockdown. Um, I've got my finger in so many different pies. It's really always hard to answer that question. So uh, I think I'm a semi-professional pot stirrer. I think might be a way of putting it. So I think that's great. I think we should, you know, I think that we should stop here and go with your objects because they'll reveal even more of you. So let's start with your first one. Okay, so my first one, and I do love this, by the way. So I, can you see this? Is that okay to the camera? Yeah. I'll turn it around. So, adjunct provocateur. Uh, I think this is called original source. I'm not entirely sure. It's very hard to get hold of now. And it smells like rose. It's a rose smell. It's quite a deep, um, sexy smell, actually. Um, I use this because obviously I'm a sex bomb, but I just don't tell too many people about that. Uh, they smell me first, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> Adult provocateur, I suppose, is uh, both the smell I love and also the way of going about life. So I think if I could have lived a different life, I would have been a spy. Now, that's just news to me. That's why this is catastrophic candor, because I've never said that out loud before. I think that's I think that makes sense. I think you're very. Um... I think you're very good at uh, spotting the things that people are not saying and also, you know, you're still going to, if you see something going on and no one's saying it, I can feel like you'd be the one to kind of highlight it anyway. Yeah, so there's, I don't know if spies are very provocative, but that, that would definitely be my persona, I think, so that nobody would see it coming. So like on a train, on a bus or anything, no matter if that place is empty, people will come and sit next to me. They have this, I have this kind of like, I think it's because I make eye contact, which is always a mistake. But then people tell me everything about their entire lives. So whether I wanted to or not, you know, no matter how long that journey is, I have learned everything there is to know about somebody. So I, I do soon some I think, well, you know, I don't do anything with this useful knowledge, but perhaps if I was actually a spy or paid to, you know, just be this friendly looking person where people tell me all sorts of things. I mean, uh, this is an invitation to MI5 or 6, I guess. So with that in mind, let's uh, move on to your second object. So my second object, which is completely separate to this, is slime. Can you see that? I could take it out, but then I'll uh, make a right old mess and. Um, well, can you see there? Right, so this is a lockdown batch of slime, galaxy slime, in fact, with which made with the kids. And um, why slime? Because it's fun to make, and uh, we did with Playful Anywhere about a year of making slime with kids because it was totally like catnip. So what we do with Playful really, I think, is respond to what people want to do that sounds a bit serious now i've gone from slime sublime to the slime to the ridiculous um yeah and so we, we don't set out with a plan particularly we kind of go somewhere and ultimately do what people like doing and bring them together and slime particularly is fun because in fact i was going to write a phd about slime and that's all coming back to me it's, it's a bonding agent so you're actually making something out of fairly boring household objects uh, or fluids or what have you but the more relaxed you are when you make slime, it's got glue, it's got some kind of um, what's called boric acid in it, which might come out of your contact lens solution. And those are the two main ingredients. You don't really need anything else, but they act as a kind of polymer. And so the chemistry of it starts to make them 
bond together. And other things will affect how well that happens. And what I've seen lots of people do is get really stressed when their slime isn't working. And the stress creates hotter hands. And the hotter your hands are, the more the glue starts to, you know, stretch. So it's no longer coagulating in the way you want it to with the bonding agent of the boric acid. So the more stress you get, the hotter you get, the slimier it becomes. And it's then slipping through your fingers. And we've done slime workshops with grown-ups who got really, really stressed and really like could not deal with the fact that um, they weren't making perfect slime. So there's something around the more relaxed you are, the less you care about the outcome, the slime kind of works with you and you work with it. And that's why kids love it because they're just prepared to go through the pain of the, is it going to turn out okay? Whereas adults tend to be a bit like, it's not working, it's not working, and they start to panic. And they lose faith in this working, and the more that happens, the less they make good slime, and the more they judge themselves on their final disastrous output. So uh, yeah, slime is a metaphor for chilling out, doing stuff with your hands that makes you feel good and not letting yourself uh, panic too much about things not working. I also feel like what you're describing is a process of you being a bit of a therapist for people and their families. Because a lot of people didn't want to make it in their house for a start. So that, that totally um, was therapeutic, I think, for the parents who were like going, we're not doing this at home. But again, the sort of therapy angle, we're quite keen at Playful, I suppose, to um, find things that people can stick their hands in, which takes their mind off their digital lives, number one. So again, you know, there's a lot of research that was done at the time of the slime fad around tactile kind of, this goes into the whole maker stuff as well, really, of um, kids wanting to fidget, to have something in their hands, to keep stretching. So once your hands deep in something like slime or clay or anything like that the last thing you're going to do is reach for your phone so it is therapeutic from the sense of if parents let go as well it's really nice because it is a side-by-side -side kind of activity to do and uh it's very immersive because you've got to go with it you can't just bail if your phone rings you're not going to pick it up so yeah it's about being present there's loads, honestly. I think when I was knee deep in this whole year of slime making, which was never the intent, I did actually think this, this could be the best metaphor for modern society that I can come across at the moment of how perfectionism can really paralyze us as well. And that letting go of that fear of failure um, results in a better slime. So, I mean, if there was ever a title for a PhD, that would be it. So I'd never want to write it. If I could do like action research, could, could someone else write up my um, slime adventures? I think this is an invitation to the universe as this will now be recorded and out there. Uh, what is, Emma, your third object? So I've mentioned chicken containers and they're generally bigger than this. This is a flat pack uh, version of our Playbox 01. Now, uh, I'm not going to try and assemble it here. It's two scale, so it is a version of a shipping container which opens from the middle out. I could get very, very geeky about shipping containers as well because I love them. I love all that they kind of, um, there's a romantic element to shipping containers. They've traveled the world. There's a story of trade, as in a lot of shipping containers will come to the UK and they'll end up here for a long time because we never export anything back again. So there are warehouses and depots and you know entire acres of land where shipping containers are seven foot high or not seven foot seven stories high um which again if i could just do anything of a day it would be wandering around the shipping container yard and looking at where all those have come from and their different brands and the numbers on them and wondering what's inside them obviously there are some fairly negative things that happen in shipping containers too which probably doesn't bear too much thinking about really um but Again, we do a lot of stuff which is about recycling and upcycling and effectively making use of what already exists in the world. So shipping containers really fit with that as well. So they've got a story behind them. They're great for practical storage. They're very difficult to set light to. We go into areas where people want to set light to them or burn them, uh, not just burn them, bomb them. Um, so 
I kind of wish the world was a place where you could put up more wooden structures, nice pavilions and things, and you know, trust the world not to set fire to those beautiful things in our midst. But my experience, and I am really idealistic, is that you only need one person with a desire to, um, you know, push their boundaries, I suppose. So, uh, yeah, containers. I never get bored of containers. The kids are bored of me talking about containers. I mean, I, you know, we could talk about containers a lot. My uh, experience of uh, a shipping container is the one that keeps all the equipment for the Dragon Boat um, uh, team I was part of earlier this year before we couldn't go on the water anymore. So they just sit there happily with some paddles and life jackets on, you know, on the Thames. And it's just, it's a bizarre little entity to kind of put things into. So, yeah, I mean, think about it. If you start noticing them, they're everywhere. They're like ev everywhere. So they're storing all sorts of stories and they're kind of like hiding in plain sight. Go back to the sort of um, start of this of being like a spy. I think shipping containers could be amazing little spies as well. So if, if I had my wicked way, they would be robots and they would um you know be going to the iot side of things they could sense things they could talk to each other they could share stories about what they see but not in a like horrible kind of cctv surveillance world kind of way you know i think there's a way that you could look at um, things from a certain height or perspective so like a ankle height for example um or you know so I'm reminded of um, my friend Molly Steenson's work on Cedric Price, who was a um, conceptual architect, if you will. And um, he had uh, um, ideas around kind of automated cities that were essentially these units or blocks that could be shipping containers that just sort of self-moved themselves across town. So I'll share that with you later on. I think you'll enjoy it. I love that. Um, I'm going to close uh, this off, Emma. How can people find you online? In many different guises, but I'll find you first. <laughs> uh, sorry. <laughs> Emma M. Behrman on Twitter or um, playfulanywhere.fun. What else? Playful Leads. Mini Playbox. There's loads. You'll find me. And uh, where can people find your playboxes? Well, currently we've just moved them to a, a little yard in Pudsey in the north of England, Leeds. So they're just sat there whilst COVID is doing its thing and we're not really doing anything with the public at the moment. So the next uh, month or so would just be me diddling about in them, I think, and just realising I've spent lots of money on exactly the same object, but in three different play boxes. I've never had them all together in one place, so this is quite exciting. It's a, um, I hope people follow your uh, adventures and I hope they work with you. And I thank you so much, Emma, for talking to us today. Thanks, Alex.